Good evening and welcome to the world today. We're at the Institute of Contemporary Arts, one of the more radical spaces in London, where an amazing exhibition is opening, Forensic Architecture. What makes this show different is that it explains how the use of modern technology and architectural knowledge can help investigate crimes, either major war crimes or ordinary crimes carried out during occupations, civil wars, etc. The architect of this exhibition, its director to be more precise, is Eil Weizmann, known as a leading architect himself. Eil, welcome once again. Could you explain to me the notion of forensic architecture and how you, you, you came to call it this? Its origin is really with my human rights work in Palestine, where I've noticed that Israeli architects and planners we're using the tools of the trade, uh, plans, architectural models, and then the construction of buildings and roads as weapons in a war against the Palestinian people. And it occurred to me that architecture could also be giving us the tools of resisting that. And uh, forensic architecture really is the provision of architectural evidence against human rights violations and war crimes. So increasingly, uh, citizens, citizen journalists are documenting what is happening around them using the most common tools that they have at hand, um, sometimes mobile phones, smartphones, or cameras, uh, sometimes simply their memory, and uploading this material online. What we try to do is really to invert the forensic gaze, really to turn the state tools against its own crimes and show that we can break the monopoly that the state has over information and knowledge and image over the battlefield and with very simple, although it looks very technological, effectively these are today, in today's technology, relatively simple means uh, investigate what has taken place and call the state to task. El, you showed me a minute ago both the origins of photography and how the early photographers in the 19th century photographed one of the key European events of the 19th century, the 1848 revolution in Paris. Maybe we could just walk over Absolutely. and you could uh, explain this to me. So in this pair, in fact, I, I think to, to my knowledge, the first war photographs uh, that exist, uh, we're seeing a moment that historically is incredibly important for us, because that's 19, 1848. That's a moment of popular uprising against state power. And that's a moment where photograph catches that instant. But again, it's not an instant because they cannot really register the movement. So Thiebaud, the daguerreotypist, simply out of his window, 
probably we can imagine almost like fearing for his life, placing the camera out of the window, takes one shot before the charge. That's the barricade. And you can see a sequence of three barricades. Yeah. And then several minutes, perhaps several hours later, we do not know the precise time, we see that the, that barricade has been stormed. But of course, the act of storming the barricade could not be captured. So what we are capturing is the state of architecture, the street before and after. We're reading the event by looking at architecture. And therefore, this is something of the origins of forensic architecture. And indeed, the before and after photograph, which is perhaps the most common trope of, of forensics. So today, that technique, what we see here, is forensic architecture found photographs that were uploaded onto Facebook by an American uh, soldier who was in uh, a prison uh, where we know torture was undertaken of Boko Haram suspect by the Cameroonian special forces. We know torture was undertaking them and now we know that American soldiers were everywhere in this base while torture was undertaken. Again, you know, perhaps 150 years apart, still a similar technique of juxtaposing photographs and telling a story uh, with them. That indeed has led to a major AFRICOM investigation by the American military that initially denied all knowledge of the torture and could no longer effectively deny it after we've been able to match each one of those Facebook photographs precisely to the architecture of the prison and show that the torture sites and the places where Americans are present are in fact the same place. Well, then there's the other example we have <coughs> in this exhibition where sections of someone from German intelligence was present when a young man was murdered by neo-Nazi groups. In the first decade of the 21st century, uh, a group of neo-Nazis called the NSU, the National Socialist Underground, were killing um, migrants uh, across Germany. Um, and it took the German state about 10 years to realize that those killings were neo-Nazi killings. So the, the, the state claimed that this is what they call Turkish on Turkish violence, or in a very derogative sense, they called it the donor killings. Only when this neo-Nazi cell was broken did the state of Germany, the public in Germany, and the police realize that these were neo-Nazi killings. Now, is it true? Because we know that already five years before that exposure, there was a Secret Service agent, a German, the equivalent of MI5, it's called in Germany, die Verfassungsschutz was present in the cafe at the time of the killing. Why was he there? A police video showing Andreas Temer's reenactment of his visit to the shop. He sought to demonstrate how he had missed seeing the body of Halit as he exited the shop. The, the person that was shot was the son of the owner, 21-year-old uh, German boy called Halit Yozgat from Turkish background. So this is the reconstruction of the cafe and This outline. is the cafe. So the, the fascists were here. They were standing, the fascists were standing over here. Yeah. And shot execution style in the head. Someone who was someone there. Someone who was there. Okay. Now, three meters away, behind that door, hmm. sat a German Secret Service agent that claimed not to have heard. Accent, present accidentally. A present absentee. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and the, uh, the shocking thing is that the German judiciary and the police accept his testimony. Now, the thing is that what we needed to do in order to undertake this investigation is to build this cafe as one to one. And we constructed the entire cafe. And with actors, we reenacted all the possible scenarios. Um, how did we know the scenarios? Because Obviously, when somebody is being killed in an internet cafe, you need to know that all your witnesses are going to be logged online. So the timing was very, very clear. Log in, log out. 
there were four witnesses within there and we could exactly locate the and time their testimony. Furthermore, we had to do the most important bit of evidence is that we had to reconstruct the loudness of the gunshot, uh, a muffled gunshot with a silencer that happened uh, in that place. This is the CZ no suppressor. We, we got an expert in Arizona to find a precise gun with a, and then place a, a, a silencer on it. Uh, we compared it to also to other guns, etc. The weapons all generated equivalent peak sound signatures ranging from 157 to 158.5 decibels. We recorded the sound of the gunshot, we played it in our one-to-one -one model and recorded the noise level at the place where the Secret Service agent was and could show uh, incontrovertibly he that must have heard. He must have of heard. Of course. He must have heard. Of course, you would know, but sometimes you need that scientific proof in order to force the German government to open it. For an eighth of a second, the volume of the shot would be as loud as a jackhammer and would have been clearly audible by Andreas Temme. We've been viciously attacked by the Christian Democratic Party in Germany, which was in charge of the Secret Service at the time. Uh, and in the same language that Assad is used to attack us, that the Israeli government is used, and to hear that same from the German Seder-U party, to see him in the same kind of group of uh, tyrants and dictators that are trying to deny their violation was, was actually very sad. It's amazing that you managed to get so far because wherever the Secret Service is involved, there's a total clampdown on information and news because our security is affected. So we know in 10 years' time or 15 years' time these will come out. But because of what is happening with people accusing them in a country like Germany where they have a past which they constantly go on about in terms of sorry, sorry, forgive us, etc. To see the Secret Service now behaving in this way covering up stuff is disturbing for many Germans who are not even political. You see that the German Secret Service was paying Nazi informers good money for information and those people used that money to perpetrate radical right-wing violence against the most vulnerable people in society. And that is something that is extremely disturbing because that is state-subsidized Nazism. So what was the concept uh, behind this uh, particular video that you constructed here? The, uh, a young Palestinian was killed and the story actually ended with the policeman being tried, the Israeli. The, the Israeli policeman is still um, in trial. Um, he was shooting uh, a Palestinian, two Palestinian kids to death um, with a, the kind of extension on his rifle that is meant for rubber bullets. So he claimed, and then the Israeli police claimed, and then the Israeli state, the, the, you know, the minister of the police and the whole government claimed we did not shoot live bullets that day. We only shoot rubber bullet. Look at the image, he has the rubber bullet extension. And what we try to show in this investigation is that you can shoot live bullets through that kind of rubber bullet extension on the gun and that the sound signature on that shot would be distinct enough for us to identify it. So we've synced up uh, several videos. We composed all those together uh, to actually build a, a very clear case against that soldier uh, for shooting those two Palestinian teenagers. By the way, on Nakba Day, uh, the annual commemoration of the Nakba by Palestinians. Because Israel does not acknowledge the Nakba, does not allow it to be commemorated, uh, Palestinians often protest during that day. And what that soldier was doing was piling a tragedy over a national tragedy. 
Let's go and see the uh, the construction now, because it was incredibly conclusive. Mm -hmm. Carrying the mortally wounded teenager to the ambulance, he later died in hospital. In an attempt to deny the killing, the military claimed that there was not a sight line between the soldiers and Nawara. To check this, we built a 3D model based on all available media sources, as well as using our own measurements on site. Here is the security camera that captured the moment Nawara and Abu Dahad fell. We modeled the trajectories from each soldier to Nawara. A direct line of sight exists, but only from the soldier on the left. The same one we already established had fired the first shot. When the IDF investigated this case, they first arrested the soldier on the right. An Israeli ballistic expert claimed that the rubber bullet extension visible on the weapon of both soldiers cannot be used to fire live ammunition. A look into the manufacturer's product catalog proved him wrong. Shooting live fire through the rubber bullets extension is possible. But to determine whether the soldier had actually fired live ammunition through the rubber bullet extension, it was necessary to understand how an M16 rifle works. A blank cartridge is loaded into the rifle's chamber, while the rubber-coated steel bullet is manually inserted into the end of the extension. There is not enough pressure in the gun to automatically discharge the blank cartridge. So after firing the rubber bullet, the cartridge needs to be manually released by cocking back the gun. The footage here was captured by a Palestinian TV crew during another point in the protest. It shows a different soldier firing a rubber-coated steel bullet and cocking back his weapon afterwards. When live ammunition is fired through an M16 rifle, the gas pressure is strong enough to automatically and immediately eject the spent cartridge from the chamber, thus reloading the weapon. Looking carefully at the soldier, we can see a single brass-colored pixel flying out of the gun. The spent cartridge was automatically ejected, indicating a live round was fired. But the soldier, who we believe shot Nadim Nawada, is also seen cocking back his gun. Cocking back his gun here can only be explained by him attempting to conceal the fact that he shot live ammunition. He pretended that he needed to reload. This is the rubber bullet extension. This yeah. soldier also has a rubber bullet extension on his gun, so the Israelis could claim that they're shooting rubber bullets. Yeah. But the only thing that gave uh, the clue for us was that the sound was very different. Here is the CCTV video, and what you see is Muhammad Abu Daher, a Palestinian kid, 16 years old, walking, not involved in anything. Oh. That is the last moment of his life. To kill a kid in that uh, situation. It was after the protest. He participated in the protest, but it was well after the protest. And there is no, there, there is not even a reason that they could claim it was necessary uh, to kill him. It was a kind of a it's vanity. To punish. It's a punishment. Yeah. Who are you people? Yeah. To challenge us. Their life are. Yeah. Is, don't is, challenge is, us yeah. on any level. Yeah. The precise moment when Nawara was shot, CNN's camera was rolling. We now know that the sound of the gunshot that killed Nadim Nawara is the result of live fire shot through a rubber bullet extension. At the precise moment. The second shot was a rubber coated steel bullet fired through the rifle's extension. Rifle at the Palestinians. And then demonstrators carrying. We confirm this by studying the images further. 
A cameraman is seen in the CCTV footage, close to the scene where the second shot is fired. The still image taken by Samar Nazar captures the same cameraman in the same position and moment. Studying this high resolution photograph reveals an additional detail. A rubber coated steel bullet in mid flight. This photograph allowed us to confirm that the second shot we heard was the sound of a rubber bullet. Let the Palestinians. Christina, uh, you're the deputy director of the project. Take us uh, to this project. This is the Mediterranean Sea mm -hmm. as a site for innumerable horrors. I mean, many a war has been fought on the Mediterranean for centuries, but this is the 21st century. People are fleeing wars. Mm -hmm. The people who fight the wars, who make the wars, who occupy countries, never take into account the people who are affected by it. Mm -hmm. And many of them trying to flee to come to Europe, which is part of the wars, are then drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. But what is really shocking and quite revealing mm. is that a lot of politicians who 20 years ago wouldn't have spoken like this are now speaking quite openly. We need deterrence, let them die. Mm -hmm. What difference does it make if they, if they drown? It will stop mm -hmm. other people from coming. Mm -hmm. So what, what was this particular project uh, uh, that, that you started work on and what, what impact is it having? Here we are looking at the long history of the Mediterranean, starting from the Arab Spring. So we look, we, we have kind of plotted this diagram of this history. Uh, as we look at, at the arrivals, the, the kind of spike in arrivals that is caused by the Arab Spring, and also the, the thickness of the line in this diagram reveals the mortality rate, so deaths. So what we're trying to, to see in this diagram is the different EU policies that have had an effect in either people crossing the, this wet border, so how many people survive this crossing. And so we see the different search and rescue operations, the Mare Nostrum, for example, that was employed um, mainly by, by Italy, but also other European Union forces, that was an active search and rescue operation. Then there's a, a rescue gap because um, the European Union countries decided that they need to deter, as you say, that we, we don't want to be attracting people crossing that border, but instead, um, if, if we don't rescue them, people will not actually attempt the crossing. It is then, in a dead calm sea, that the migrants' vessel encountered a military ship. This one is the boat of hand, okay? Mm -hmm. The ship boat there, okay? The ship, okay? You mean this distance? No, it's very long distance, uh, right? almost 700 meters, something like that. They are watching that, okay? So, they made a rotation. Around your... Yeah, around that. Okay. At the third one, they come like this. Very close? Yeah, very close, around 10 meters or 9 meters. We cannot close to them because it's too much, the water is not good. Sure. We are just watching them, people is dying. And also a children, some people are drinking water, crying, something like that. So they are asking them for help, but they didn't get as anything, only taking pictures. Despite witnessing the passengers suffering, the military vessel left without providing them with any assistance. But what we've noticed is that within the rescue gap, yes, some people, less people attempted the crossing, but also the mortality rate was much, much higher. So what we see here is an actual lethal policy. And then further than that, we, we kind of look at, uh, at different phases up until this current moment where we are in a phase that, that we call Mare Clausum, so closed sea which is an attempt to solidify that, that liquid uh, line, that border. So to, to, to somehow not allow anyone to cross by either um, helping the Libyan Coast Guard, for example, to keep them within the territorial waters 
or by accusing different NGOs that are currently the only ones who are performing search and rescue operations by accusing them for, for um, collaborating with, uh, with different traffickers. This is um, a boat from the, the German NGO Jugendrettet um, that was confiscated by the Italian Coast Guard because it was uh, the, because of allegations that they were actually um, colluding with with, with smugglers, so um, it was a complete lie. It was a complete lie. A complete lie. Target vessel C is the vessel identified by the KK marking, which, according to the Italian authorities, had been towed by the Lily towards Libyan territorial waters. We have obtained a short clip of a video shot by a Reuters journalist, which seems to be the source of the still image, mobilized against the crew of the Juventa. According to the clip's metadata, it was shot around 7.34, 14 minutes after the Lily is seen leaving the disembarkation scene. By analyzing wind direction recorded in meteorological data, we can establish the camera's orientation and thus the direction of travel. Wind data from 8 in the morning on the 18th of June shows that waves were traveling east to west in our area of interest. This analysis therefore suggests that what we see in the image used in the Italian order of seizure is in fact the lily towing target vessel C in a northeast direction, that is, away from the Libyan coast and not towards it, as suggested by the Italian prosecutor. It was confiscated, there are no uh, charges being pressed because there, there is no, nothing in that story, but yet they, that particular NGO cannot perform search and rescue operations at the moment. So it's, they have produced enough evidence and leaked it to the media to, to kind of cast a, um, a shadow on, on the operations of that NGO. So this is one of the cases that we are investigating here, and this is an ongoing investigation. We are going to be looking at it um, for the coming months and hopefully present it in the European Court of Human Rights. So, so w one of the aims, of course, is to, I was going to say, make the Mediterranean normal again. Mm -hmm. But it's never been quite normal. This is what sort of shocking because, you know, the Second World War, um, planes brought down, submarines blowing up, uh, ships each of the countries and then you go back of course to the Middle Ages as some of the big battles between Islam, Islamic civilization and Western Christendom were fought. So it's a stormy sea and what strikes me that of these events being particularly horrific because this isn't meant to be a war. Those mm. other things were wars, we knew what to expect. Mm. Here it's ordinary people husbands, wives, children, brothers, sisters, trying to get out of a war zone and then finding that the Mediterranean itself is being made by some of these EU countries into a new war zone and being left to die. I mean, that's what's really horrific about it. The water leaves no trace. So what we find um, the difficulty in, in kind of investigating those cases is that we have to piece together footage, disparate footage, um, Sometimes we, we may be having nothing, not even one video. And, um, and it's very difficult to even pinpoint the location of the event because there's nothing that, that really signifies location. It is an absolute you know, horizontal plane of the sea. So what we find is that the Mediterranean, even though it, is, it, is, um, it looks like um, you know, a, a space of absolute erasure, a desert, um, in kind of a visual desert. Um, nevertheless, we do have a lot of information and it is a highly surveyed area. So when you have um, a search and rescue operation that, that is stopped um, purposefully, what you have then is, is um, the, the death by rescue report. is basically describing this moment where the um, EU is actually giving away the responsibility of search and rescue to different uh, commercial ships because any ship that happens it's to be... It's privatization. It's privatization, exactly. So any ship that happens to, to pass on the way of, of a, a smuggler's boat or a migrant boat, they would have to stop and perform search and rescue operations, but often you would have 
container ships, cargo ships that are trying to maneuver around a small boat. And that would mean that the boat would be capsizing. So there you have death by rescue, death at the moment of the rescue. So it's a, an absolute criminal um, policy. So we have to, to look back into our own decisions, political decisions as EU states, and figure out what do those decisions mean in, in, on those crucial moments.